Good afternoon and welcome to Remaking the Economy, Leveraging Anchor Institutions. I'm Steve Dubb and I'm Senior Editor at uh, Nonprofit Quarterly. Uh, this webinar is the fifth in a series that uh, we are doing about how civil society can participate in making the U.S. economy a more democratic system. Uh, before we conclude the series, we'll have two more sessions, one on building policy agendas in April and one on systems change, which will focus on Puerto Rico in May. And we hope you'll join us uh, for both of those as well. Uh, you'll help hear more about them in follow-up emails. And just to remember, uh, we consistently do these the second Thursday of the month at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we are fortunate today to be joined by three guests, uh, Melvin Colon, uh, Executive Director of the South Side of Institutions Neighborhood Alliance in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, Felipe Wichker, uh, founder and executive director of the Community Purchasing Alliance in Washington, D.C., and uh, Jessica Curtis, senior advisor at the Center for Community Consumer Engagement, sorry, in health innovation at, at Community Catalyst in Boston. Um, we'll also be uh, showing a video interview with uh, Bill Jenneret, uh, who's vice president for community engagement at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. A few notes before we get started. First, uh, we're very excited to take all of your questions. And we'll be leaving some time at the end of the webinar to allow panelists to answer them. Uh, please enter any questions you have into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. And I will share them with the panelists when we get to that part of the discussion. And we will leave a considerable time for uh, your questions, so please do enter those. Uh, second, we'll be sharing the slides and recording with everyone via email uh, after the webinar. Uh, so you don't need to ask if you'll get the slides after the recording. You, you will. Uh, we'll email them out and we'll also post them on the Nonprofit Quarterly webpage within a couple of days. Um, finally, uh, we are very ha happy to offer this webinar uh, free of charge to all of our community. But of course, it is not free for us to produce these. And uh, so if you can, uh, please consider supporting Nonprofit Quarterly today uh, so we can continue to share uh, these brilliant thinkers and exciting topics with you. Um, so thanks uh, for being here today. Uh, we'll be asking a few questions uh, after the webinar too, so please keep a lookout for that window uh, after our conversation. Uh, so with that, um, I'll uh, give a, a few notes about the field and then we'll move to our speakers. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're doing this uh, webinar on, on anchor institutions. And in the series till now, we've looked at uh, land, labor, and capital. And, and why look at anchor institutions? And you know, one big reason is because they're a large percentage of the uh, nonprofit sector. Um, and they become more important over time. Uh, so they're economic engines as both employers and purchasers of goods and services uh, because often they can't move as easily as other types of businesses. They have a vested interest in the surrounding communities, not always aligned, of course, uh, and we'll be talking about this on the, on the call, um, with the interests of, of uh, community groups uh, as a whole, but nonetheless uh, difficult to move. And the fact that they're typically nonprofit or public means, of course, that these are community controlled institutions, at least legally speaking, and, and part of the, the potential for uh, anchor institutions is uh, the potential for them to actually be representative of that community voice. Uh, next slide, please. And, and so um, I'm not going to go over all the details of the slide. What's important to recognize here, though, is that uh, there's considerable leverage. You know, uh, we're talking about uh, hospitals alone are 34% of the nonprofit sector, uh, higher ed, another 12%. Uh, they, they have over 500 million a year in purchasing, 5% of all employees, I should say, in the United States. So this is a large, these are large sectors, very important uh, to uh, community economies everywhere. And a lot of different ways that they can inter interact with communities, you know, through their investments, uh, through hiring, through purchasing, through their real estate for good or ill, uh, by being, uh, providing technical assistance, by um, incubating businesses, and by being a convener uh, for the community. So there's a lot of different uh, tools and uh, a lot of resources, even if um, often anchor institutions face the same kind of financial pressures that any business face. 
Um, so this is a quote uh, that comes from uh, a book that I co-authored with uh, Rita Hodges at the uh, Netter Center for Community Partnerships at the University of Pennsylvania um, called The Road Half Traveled. And so our idea was that, you know, there's not a choice whether a nonprofit uh, anchor institution is an anchor institution. There is a choice on whether they act on that in their mission. And so our idea is that if they did, you would be consciously applying place-based economic power in combination with the uh, human intellectual resources to better the welfare of the communities in which they res reside. Um, that to us is uh, the vision of, of what anchors can do. Um, and uh, there's been a lot more talk about anchor institutions um, and some movement in that direction, but, but certainly a long, long way to go. Um, Half Traveled may have been an optimistic title. Um, so this is where we're at in the series. As I mentioned, there's two more in the webinar series, uh, but this surely A won't be the last webinar series that we do on uh, the economy. And also we just launched a, a column that I'm writing called Economy Remix. Uh, and uh, it's free and you're encouraged to subscribe to it and you should hear things from me a couple times a month. And I'm open to, um, to your input of topics to cover. So please feel free to uh, write me with your suggestions at steve at mpqmag.org. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is just to re review the, the, the objectives, both of the series and more broadly of uh, Nonprofit Quarterly's economic justice uh, program. Um, you know, we, we hope to clarify core principles, uh, develop a, a toolkit, understand the whole ecosystems of support that allow for um, uh, more democratic economies, um, identify ways to decolonize wealth and foster racial equity, highlight points of leverage like we're doing today with anchor institutions, foster shifts in practice and thinking, and, and, and be cognizant of the need to do day-to-day -day work as well as have a longer-term vision uh, for a different type of economy. Welcome. Uh, uh, Steve Dubb, senior editor of Nonprofit Quarterly, uh, here uh, interviewing Bill Jenneret, uh, vice president of community engagement at Duquesne University, and prior to that, uh, founder of Urban Innovation 21, a community development organization in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In terms of what we're calling uh, anchor institutions, eds and meds and so forth, um, how can universities and hospitals uh, support uh, reducing wealth concentration? Well, thanks a lot, Steve, and thanks for, for all the, the great work that you and your organization do. And I think the best ways that universities can really help is to support existing uh, really community-led and community-driven strategies. Um, you know, I think when, when universities lead strategies, you can often get in trouble because um, unfortunately, you know, universities are often, you know, disconnected from uh, the work that's taking place on the ground, right? Um, but universities have a lot of resources they can offer. Great, thanks, Bill. You know, one of the reasons that we look at anchor institutions is because, of course, the role, the the scale of uh, nonprofit eds and meds has increased so much over time. What are sort of the positives and negatives of this for for the economy? Sure. I mean, when you look at a, a city like Pittsburgh, we've done, you know, on a macro level, a good job of transforming our economy. Right, it's now one that's led by eds and meds, and and that's good to some degree. I think one of the challenges is that um, the eds and meds economy never replaced the manufacturing economy, at least in terms of providing good middle class jobs. I mean, I remember when I grew up in Pittsburgh, we had over six hundred thousand people. In the city now, we have three hundred thousand people. Um, you know, one of our challenges as a region is, you know, one third of our population is living at or below the poverty line. So we have a lot of poverty and a lot of people that haven't been connected to to this new economy. Great. Um, as you know, uh, over the past decade, um, the term anchor institution has gained popularity. But frankly, eds and meds are often viewed with, with scorn by community members. Um, so they're not always seen as great partners. And so why is that? And what would need to happen for that to change? Well, I think traditionally they haven't, you know, necessarily been been good partners. Now, uh, it's not the same for for all universities. I mean, I think um, one of the things that excited me about 
Duquesne and some other universities is that um, they have been doing community engagement uh, for, for a long time. Uh, I think one of the challenges is, you know, making sure that that engagement is organized and actually has um, an impact that can be measured externally. And so that's what we're, we're working to do. Right. I know you were at uh, Urban Innovation 21 for a decade before you came to, to Duquesne. And when you were on sort of the outside of the anchor institution world, I'm obviously you were partnering with anchors who are on your board and so forth. But, you know, how how did you think of the role of anchor institutions? Sure. So, you know, our organization was started by uh, several anchors, so Duquesne being one, but also our health system. And I think one of the things that, that, that they did really well was they helped launch our organization and then they got out of the way. They didn't own it, right? Um, and there was a lot of discussion sort of early on whether, you know, the organization should have been part of the university or part of the hospital system. And uh, they decided, and I think it was a good decision, not to make it part of, of either one for it to be its own separate 501c3. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that's a, a good example of, of how, you know, um, anchor institutions can help. I mean, you know, we can help launch things. They also provided a, a variety of different support, um, financial support, uh, the support of professors and students. And so that was, that was really good. And they made long-term commitments, which I think is important. Great. Thanks. I think I want to dive in a little bit more here. You know, you're dealing with communities of, of color, like the Hill District, working with often white dominated anchor institutions, you know, how is that dynamic and negotiated um, so that you can build effective partnerships? Sure. Um, I mean, there are two things that anchors can offer as it relates to, to wealth building. One, access to good jobs and through uh, their supply chain. So um, we have a couple of uh, programs that we're in the emphasis efficiency stage of, of launching, but it's very important for um, anchors to go above and beyond doing good work in communities. Um, I think they have to, you know, make a concerted effort to provide good jobs, uh, but also profitable contracting opportunities with uh, minority-owned businesses. Great, thanks. I was curious, you, you, you made the jump over to uh, Duquesne, so you have a somewhat different vantage point, I suppose, now, you know, working for an anchor institution directly. Do you see that the role of anchor institutions uh, differently now than when you were at Urban Innovation 21? Um, I do, I do, because, you know, now I'm sort of in the anchor. So I, I see the potential. I also see some of the challenges for um, a region like Pittsburgh. When you look at our universities collectively, and you look at the number of jobs they provide, when you look at their spend, when you look at the multiplier effect, I mean, you really see see the power. Um, but I also see challenges, right? I mean, the, the university is, in many cases, um, removed from the community, and and that's not necessarily the fault of the, the university. The university has a primary mission of educating students, you know, and, and producing research. And universities are doing this in a, in a very tough and competitive climate. Great, thanks. Um, so for, for nonprofit community groups, many of whom, you know, are, are probably on this call, um, you know, what advice would you give them in terms of, you know, how to uh, approach uh, anchor institutions if they see an opportunity for partnership? Sure. I think first and foremost, see if that university has a strategic plan. So that that's one. I think two, nonprofits really need to understand what they want to get out of a relationship with the university, because oftentimes, you know, it's, it's like when you have any type of power dynamic. You know, the most powerful entity can can sort of dictate, and they're often very clear about what they want, right? Um, so a lot of times, universities you have faculty that want to do research. Right. Well, doing research might not be what what the community organization wants. So I think it's really important um, that the community organization, you know, lets the university know what they want. Um, and then I think there's also a need to sort of understand what the university needs, uh, because if the uh, relationship is going to be long term, it's going to have to be a win win for both parties. Right. I wanted to ask also about um, what are 
cultural changes that are needed uh, for nonprofit anchor institutions to reach their potential. How do we make these community institutions, you know, actually uh, reflect the needs of the community? Sure. I mean, I think a couple things. Institutions, one, have to make sure that people that, that, that work there um, actually reflect the communities that they're trying to help. I think that's really important. And uh, too often we don't see that um, in universities. I also think that universities have to realize that even though uh, they might have more power, um, they are not better, they are not more important. Um, we talk about moving the needle in terms of community. Community has to be viewed, and they have to be treated as equal partners. And that's something that's difficult for universities. Universities are, um, you know, you know, it's called the ivory tower for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but oftentimes there's a, this, this elitism that uh, gets in the way of uh, real, authentic, and catalytic work being done. Right. Anything more you want to say about the uh, ivory tower and how you might actually, you know, jettison that image and 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 break down some of the elitism well i think one of the things that's important is um sort of defining what the problem is and then defining what the outcome is that, that everybody wants to see right and just sort of getting that on the table if the outcome the university wants to see is research around the problem then right there in my mind that means that the problem's not going to be solved right so, Bill, I think this brings me to the end of my questions. I always ask uh, at the end, is there anything else uh, that you would like to add? Um, no, other than um, I, I think it's really important for uh, residents where communities work to ask the tough questions and to, you know, not be afraid to, to press universities about what their goals and objectives are in terms of their community engagement. Because, you know, as you mentioned, Steve, when we talk about universities doing community engagement, we talk about anchor institutions, um, they become these buzzwords, right? And if universities, hospital systems, and other anchors are actually going to play a role in really being helpful, um, they have to be asked the hard questions. And it's really important to see uh, specifically what they're what they're looking to do right um well bill thanks so uh, much for your time and uh, we'll return to the webinar thanks again thank you appreciate it so uh, that was an interview uh with uh bill jenner of duquesne and now we're gonna go to uh, felipe Witschker of uh, community purchasing alliance and then we'll come back hopefully we'll uh, be able to hear from melvin Thanks so much, Steve. So I'm the founder and executive director of the Community Purchasing Alliance, and we're a cooperative in Washington, D.C., um, founded in 2014. Um, and in 2018, we've built a sustainable revenue model with schools and churches and other religious organizations to help um, become a new kind of anchor institution. And uh, just this past year, we've aggregated about 16.9 million in contracts. Um, with security, janitorial, electricity, trash, solar, copier, all kinds of services. And what's exciting is that by putting in front of um, these nonprofit um, property owners, we've been able to help them shift about $10 million, 9.5 million to uh, minority owned businesses. Next slide. So we're this interesting blend of community organizing and kind of technical savvy business consultants. So imagine, um, this kind of comes out of our earned income strategy for the Washington Interfaith Network, which was the founding group we started partnering with um, about five, seven years ago. And we've linked up with them such that our portion of our profits go back to fund community organizing. Um, and now we're you know, three years into having a sustainable revenue stream um, that not only goes back to the community organizing, but goes back to the mem member owners themselves. And so when a church purchases, let's say an electricity contract, um, 5% of that transaction comes to the co-op and then we return any profits back to the member owner at the end. Um, and it's it's been um, you know really interesting to try to bring relational community organizing one-on-one -on -one meetings and challenge people to think 
about how much power they actually have just in their small um, community-owned entities. And so we try to bring a, a synthetic process that makes sense of relatively complicated markets like a solar or utilities and try to alleviate the administrative burden while at the same time um, integrating space for them to think about the longer term strategic mission in the community um, that, that they play. And we, we do that kind of in two ways. One is we create group spaces where we get peer decision makers together. And, um, and then we do that you know, one on one helping accompany people more directly. Um, and let, let me give you a tangible example. Uh, next slide. We started working with um, Travion Smith, who is the founder of LGC Security um, in 2016. And at the time, Travion was a full-time 911 dispatcher. And he had started the security company in his kind of uh, evenings and weekends. And basically, he was doing event security for the DC Jazz Festival. And you could just feel the, the drive and ambition that he had. And I, of course, immediately saw that. but. Um, he was untested. And so a charter school called me and said, Felipe, this company, LGC, calls me every single day. They really want to provide security services for my school, uh, but I don't have any need for that right now. Um, so I said, that's fine. I'll actually include him in our next um, our request for proposals on behalf of 10 other charter schools who are actively looking for security services right now in DC. And sure enough, Heather from an alternative high school said, that'd be great. I think he's exactly what we need in terms of fit. And so uh, it turns out that um, she hired him and within you know six months, she could see the culture of the school transformed. Um, the way Travion was able to bring his experience and knowledge of the community and the people and the students and empathize with them and teach his guards conflict resolution, alternative means of, uh, of dealing with uh, behavior. Teachers just said, you know, kids are in the classroom and the bell rings now and ready to learn. And it just changed everything. Um, and over time, that story got shared around. And KIPP DC, about a year later, contracted with Travion for uh, more than a million dollars in security services across six of their campuses. Um, and so here we're seeing an example of a small startup with three people when we met him, now has more than 100 full time staff, as you could see in the bottom left corner, and um, recently won a contract with Howard University as well. So you can see how we see ourselves, the aggregation of small local churches that only have 10,000 or 100,000 in spend can really be the stepping stones for small businesses to really build wealth more equitably and democratically. So I'll go to the next slide here. And I think it begins with the relational culture. And um, it begins with trying to ask people. Um, I think it's so often we, we get um, tied up in the missional work and realize that sometimes the, the treasurer or the finance person, um, like you see this Ellen here on, on the right is the executive director of a synagogue. And she, um, I met her and she was very rigorous in her analysis of contracts for her synagogue. But when you gave her the opportunity to think more expansively about um, her values and the mission of the synagogue, Tikkun Olam, to repair the world, um, she, she said, I would love to be a part of this co-op because it helps me not only make smarter decisions with my everyday uh, transactions about um, the copy machine and taking out the trash and, and making those decisions to help find local providers and, and providers uh, that are companies owned by women and people in our surrounding community and making those decisions easier for her. Um, so next slide. So in the process, we've realized we've begun to build a new type of anchor institution. And we realize that too often there's this tension. Um, we see you know, the trend in, in universities and hospitals towards strategic procurement, something that is centralized. Um, and it used to be that each department had its own budget. But today, increasingly, that's going towards one centralized procurement department that has tens of millions or hundreds of, or billions of dollars. Um, and even aggregating that at a larger level with group purchasing organizations. And essentially, if that kind of is at odds or going against the grain of this desire to work with small local businesses, and often that have only a few people and staff and a few hundred thousand dollars in revenue or less. And so we think smaller community institutions like churches, schools, and others, it's easier to build relationships with the people that make the contracting decisions at those smaller anchors. And um, they don't control you know, hundreds of millions, but um, at the end of the day, they can make contracting decisions uh, on a regular basis that um, integrates the values they have in the community. And they're already aligned on that level. Um, kind of like Bill said, it's the, the mission of the university is somewhat different than, than the focus here. And I think our smaller community institutions have the mission is more closely tied to educating the next generation of, of students in our community. Um, and sometimes we can find smaller businesses or a really talented entrepreneur like Travion Smith and have it be a great fit 
for, for some of our charter schools. Um, and sometimes because the charter schools or churches are less well resourced in their purchasing procurement departments, um, it's easier for a community group like ours, the Community Purchasing Alliance, to show up and add real tangible value to the everyday transaction, tr transactions they have around maintaining their property. So it's easier, I think, to become truly useful and at the same time present them with a lot more mission aligned options. And so in the process, we're trying to you know, build a new anchor institution. And here are some pictures of our, our meeting just last week in Durham, North Carolina, where we're expanding a new a region of our co-op. We're also beginning to do some work in, in Connecticut and in Boston. And you know, really eager to share this model with all those who are interested. Um, so look forward to talking to some more with your questions here in a minute. Um, Felipe, thanks. And uh, next we'll hear from uh, Jessica Curtis from Community Catalyst. Jessica? Hi, everyone. Uh, so a brief introduction to Community Catalyst. We are a consumer health advocacy organization. And so we work primarily with the meds portion of today's discussion. Um, and so part of what I want to talk about briefly is the work that we've been doing with some community organizations to really partner with local hospitals around community priorities that are health adjacent, but not, are not necessarily medical care. And I thought just it might be helpful for you to understand really what's driving the healthcare sector to think differently anyway. What is it? What is in it for hospitals to really have these partnerships and sit down with the community organization? And I've included a few things here. One is that we're just changing how hospitals and medical providers get paid for care. It used to be that they got paid per service, and now they're getting paid more and more frequently based on outcome. And there's a growing recognition that what happens within the four walls of a doctor's office or a hospital really has a limited uh, role in how healthy patients can be. They're returning back to neighborhoods and housing and environmental factors that can cause distress um, and that can also be harmful for them. So there's a self-interest on the part of the medical sector now to really think more deeply about what we call the social and economic factors that impact health. And in addition to that, there's um, increasing regulation in some cases, especially for hospitals, to really think in other ways more broadly about how they're investing in community health. Next slide. So um, Bill Generant mentioned this, really understanding the importance of understanding the community context and for community organizations to come to a partner with an idea of a problem and a solution. And so one of the things that Community Catalyst has done is really worked with the two organizations that I'm going to talk about today to understand what are the priorities for residents in their communities? And where is there a solution, a policy solution, that may be the right solution to address that need? We, as an advocacy organization, had a lot of experience working with hospitals on something called community benefit, which you may be familiar with. Um, but in the healthcare context, is really resources that hospitals spend not on medical care per se, but on broader community health issues. And what we observed was that there was very little connection between community priorities and very few opportunities for community input. So we advocated for that to change at the federal level and then had the opportunity to work with a number of small institutions, small community-based organizations to trot that new policy out and see if it really did free up opportunities for them to work with local hospitals. Next slide. I wanna highlight two examples of what that work, look, work looked like. We worked with the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, which is um, a wonderful organization in the Bronx, and they were very interested in a couple of different issues, the addressing housing risk factors that impacted health. They knew that they had a lot of public and private housing units where lead and mold and pests were problems that were leading to higher hospital utilization, and they also had a project that was really interested in building additional pathways to good jobs. Um, and so they unified those two and approached the local hospital, Montefiore, and said, we'd really like to work with you to identify ways to get your investment in this green jobs program that we want to build. Um, and they actually were successful in working with Montefiore to draw down some additional funding to support that work, not just to address the health risks, but also to address the community's priority around green jobs. I want to mention, too, um, that as part of this work, they had a strong focus on building community capacity and ended up working with us to develop a training for community residents on how things like housing, transportation, um, and economic opportunity are all, cre are all connected to health. And they ended up training over 850 residents through that program. 
one of the other communities that we worked with was Wait House Community Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And this is another community, predominantly Latino immigrant, Latinx um, immigrant community, um, right in the middle of a number of healthcare institutions and from their perspective, getting really poor access to care, um, really not able to access the system, partially due to immigration status, partially due to income. And so they worked with a hospital there um, originally around environmental health issues, that was really their priority. They approached one hospital originally that wasn't interested in addressing those issues, but was interested in partnering with them. And to Bill's point, the community said, actually, we're not so interested in your topic, thank you. Uh, but they cordially walked away and found another partner. And what they realized with this experience was that part of the challenge for hospitals is how do we create opportunities for input from the community? So they were able to work closely with hospital community benefit staff at creating a different community health needs assessment process that focused mostly on getting key interviews with the leaders of color in the communities that the hospital was serving. Next slide. And I wanted to highlight this because it really shifted for the hospital a sense of what the priorities were. This is still a very rare um, outcome, I think, in terms of hospital community benefit, but you can see here that the community health needs assessment, based on the input that they heard from newer voices in the community, actually identified structural racism as a key issue impacting all of these different domains, health, economics, um, and environment. And so they've continued to work forward together. Um, but it was a very powerful example of how things can change when the community is involved. And I look forward to discussing more when we get to questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. And uh, we're gonna try to go back to uh, Melvin. And before I hand it off to Melvin, just a reminder, uh, please uh, put your questions in the question box. So the more the merrier, and we will get to them. So uh, with no more ado, Melvin. Hi, Sina is a partnership located in, it's a partnership between three anchor institutions, uh, two as Hartford Hospital and the Connecticut Children's Medical Center and a college, Trinity College, located in Hartford, Connecticut, and a low-income Puerto Rican community called Far Palo. Um, and these anchor institutions have been working together for over 40 years now. Um, and um, the neighborhood itself, as I said, very low income, majority Puerto Rican neighborhood. It's got a diverse representation of other folks that are coming in. Um, and over the years, we've been around for a long time, we've had a few successes. Uh, the next slide shows one of uh, the successes that China is best known for, the next slide being the learning corridor. Uh, that was a brownfield uh, at one time a bus yard and uh, it was a place that was contaminated. Um, it was a real community eyesore and a lot of the activists wanted to do something with that site. Um, at the time, the president of Trinity College was Evan Dobell, who really wanted to promote the, the, the mission of the college as being part of, uh, an important element of that to uh, promote the neighborhood and to uh, promote the community de development in the neighborhood. And so he convened the other institutions and he was, and through Sino was able to leverage um, hundreds of a hundred million dollars to convert that brownfield into a campus for four excellent schools and the Boys and Girls Club and uh, it houses a theater site and so forth. So that's quite a signature project. But in the last few years, we've also, in the last 10, 15 years, we've also been involved in home ownership development. Uh, and more recently, um, we've been involved with um, a, an employment project. Years ago, we used to train, uh, back in the 80s, we used to train nurses to take uh, people to become uh, CNAs to take on jobs at the institutions, and we also did some secretarial training. Uh, we've revived that program, and now we have an institutional hiring program working with neighborhood residents getting to them through training programs and uh, getting them into positions, into entry-level positions in the hospitals. And that, that's uh, just started about a year ago, and that's, that's becoming very successful as we hire, uh, as we develop relationships with the hiring managers. Um, so we also, the institutions also have a, uh, a housing incentive program that provides sound payment assistance to employees who 
want to live in the neighborhood uh, to provide them with a $10,000 down payment. Um, these are programs that, as I said, China's been around for 40 years. These are programs that were tried about 30 years ago, and these are programs that we revived in one way or another. Um, and I'll talk a little more uh, about why we uh, go back, but sometimes we have to um, recycle some of our own programs. A challenge that we that we face on a regular basis is um, find the, the community, Frog Hollow, the community that we're, uh, in which we're located, is, is the gateway neighborhood. I think every major group that go, comes into the region uh, comes into our neighborhood and, uh, at one point or another. So we're very much a community of migrants. For the last uh, 20 to 30 years, Puerto Ricans have been uh, the mainstay of the community, the majority of the community. Um, and at the same time, that, that coincided with a, with, a, with a period of economic restructuring, with a lot of industry leaving, with a high rate of unemployment, and um, uh, uh, an up uptick in gang activity. And so the neighborhood has received uh, uh, negative publicity from, from the media, uh, some of which is, I think, focuses on the, on the racial aspects, on the groups that are living there now. And I think that there's been a reception uh, in the region, which is not a majority, uh, which is a, mainly a, a, a white region, um, that this is the, the Frog Hollow, the neighborhood, and the city of Hartford as a whole is dangerous to come into. And so um, this is something that uh, not only is, I think, perpetrated by the media, but also uh, by the community at large that um, because of the, the income characteristics and the racial characteristics of the, of the neighborhood, it's not a safe place to come to. And I think that, that uh, influences uh, some of the folks who come to work at the institutions. And I will say the caregivers, uh, most of the folks, most of the most of the folks that they that they treat are people of color at, at the hospitals, and so uh, I don't think that uh, that caregivers are are um, in any way uh, the majority are not uh, racially biased in that sense. But but they at work they're told you know this is not the best place to 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 live or to work. They hear that message. And so for many of them, uh, they choose to live outside of the city. They choose to do their shopping outside of the neighborhood. Um, and so it's very frustrating for us to know that we have about 10,000 people in our community who represent real buying power and who could also invest in the neighborhood in terms of real estate. Um, and so we've been working with the institutions, and, and the institutions, I should say, have been very receptive around the idea of, of uh, opening that up. Um, and then um, so we talked about some of our successes. We're moving on to the last slide in, in this uh, in this deck now, which is which also points to another um, uh, challenge that we have, and that is that we since we've been around, we've had many changes in leadership. I mentioned Evan Dobell is a very visionary leader at Trinity College, uh, but. Every time we have a new leader, and we have we've had over uh, I think 18, 15 or 18 leadership transitions in terms of the chief executives of each of the institutions. We we need to make the case for Sino. We need to make the case for the neighborhood, um, and we have to contend with different uh, economic climates. So it's a, it's a challenge to uh, continue the to make sure that we have continued support from the institutions. Um, right now, because we are reviving some of these programs, we we have shown. We certainly have a, a group currently of very committed uh, institutional chief executives that are supporting China. Okay, thanks, uh, um, Melvin, and uh, we'll welcome back all the other panelists. And uh, I'll ask a few questions, and then uh, we will open it up to the floor. So please keep uh, your questions uh, coming, and we will get to the. Uh, quite soon, I believe. Um, but I want to start, um, I think, with a question to uh, Felipe about how do you build a business model that gets anchors and communities to uh, both come to the table? And, uh, you know, I'll challenge you a little bit. So there's sort of the, the small scale institutions you're working with, but, you know, maybe think about a little bit about how would you actually move this up? How could this, you're, you're working in Durham now, uh, I believe there's a large university and hospital system in Durham. Um, you know, you know, you wouldn't start with them. So, but would 
do you envision at some point maybe bringing them in? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we definitely have talked with Duke Real Estate's team and their procurement office. And I think part of the strategy we're, we're taking is that we recognize that our, you know, our community nonprofits, the schools and churches, we own property as well, right? And we can kind of use the sense that, look, we're actually doing something that's anchoring the community and caring, trying to promote, more practically take steps at the same time, build a sustainable revenue model, which I think is so key, Steve, in your question there. Like, I think we need business models to sustain the work so that, like Melvin said, every community has a a uh, community group that's sustained for 30 or 40 years and beyond. And I think constantly building power. And I think, you know, Duke just made the decision to not kind of give a land grant for a light rail project that would have been, you know, absolutely essential to the region and obviously huge for economic development. Um, so I, I think it's it's imperative that I think community nonprofits um, lead and show anchors how they can lead differently um, with our own economic actions. And I think that's kind of the model we're taking. Um, I do think we can organize more broadly. Um, we're trying to work with self-help is a big credit union here, large property owner in Durham. We're trying to work with uh, Capital Broadcasting has redeveloped a lot of, uh, of the downtown Durham area as well and use some large property owners to kind of say, look, Duke, are you going to participate in the kind of um, transforming of our community that I think um, can be very positive for the long haul? Great, okay, thanks. Um, so Jessica, I was going to ask you a question about, you know, so you Community Catalyst is kind of an interesting organization because you work at a lot of different levels, right? You you work in advocacy, so you're going to Congress and things like that, and then you work with the institutions. And you know, there's the, nonprofits have to make choices, right, about strategy and tactics mm -hmm. and so forth. And and sometimes uh, a strategy of partnering with an anchor institution is the right strategy, and sometimes it isn't. Um, so you know, how do you Think about that and, and sort of the interaction of the different levels, whether it's public or private or anchor. Yeah, and I would I would say even an additional layer of complication for community catalysts is that we have to think about it for ourselves. Um, and then the posture that we've taken with the community organizations that we've been working with is that's not our decision to make. That's your decision to make in the local context. So <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> the um, frequently I knew that would happen as soon as I took my phone off mute. Um, uh, so one of the one of the things that we frequently will share are some of the values and principles that have guided us in that decision. Um, but some of the things that seem to be pretty consistent is when we're working with the community or when we're doing our own work, we really try to understand the problem and to help the community understand the problem that they're looking at. Our organization, I think, has a unique approach to advocacy because we don't always see advocacy as necessarily adversarial. Um, and so we try to adopt the approach that there is strength in asking the hard questions of both hospitals and regulators, um, and that sometimes their answers to those questions mean we have to elevate up to a different level um, to thinking more about public policy. And sometimes their answers mean that we can partner. So what's been really critical for us is to help communities understand and frame their question um, and the issue that they're seeing and give them a range of potential options for whether this is something that, if it's a neighborhood level problem, might have a neighborhood level solution. If you've tried approaching all the different avenues within a hospital system, for example, um, and you're getting rebuffed consistently possibly it's a time to think differently about what policy barriers or facilitators could be in place that would make this conversation conversation easier next time. So we really we really work with people to understand context and to also understand their relationship with a particular institution. Um, and the last thing I would say to that is, is that for us anyway, and this has I think been true for many of our community partners, when people do have a long-term relationship with another stakeholder, I think everybody understands there are times when you're going to be standing on the same side of a line and opposite each other. And so, you know, we frequently will talk about that very openly with our own hospital partners. Um, and we encourage community partners to also think about that um, as a long term, long term strategy as well. Great. Thanks. And I think I'm going to throw that to uh, well, I know Felipe has been involved in community organizing and, and you said something, Jessica, about you know, um, that, you know, that there are different, the advocacy is not always adversarial. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, right? Um, but, you know, how do you, uh, both 
Felipe and Melvin, you you both have experience in community organizing of one sort or another. How how do you think about those those balancing issues? Well, I'll share just from a pragmatic perspective. We're trying to grow our work in Washington D.C. with um, Trinity Washington University, a college there that serves mostly um, people of color, women of color, and then also Catholic University. And I think the entry point, they're actively working with the city to try to find more neighborhood companies to partner with. And so, in a conversation with uh, the procurement department um, at Catholic University a few weeks ago, um, they were very eager to hear our list of small janitorial and security companies that might be able to serve them for particular buildings. And I think the approach I'm taking is. We, we try to build a relationship based on the trust and delivering real tangible market value that helps them get services uh, met uh, more productively and effectively and meet their core um, basic objectives. But then once we're in partnership with them, how do we cast a bigger vision and push them and create tension between where we are today and where we really need to be on these bigger challenges? And I think once you start creating that tension and trust, I think um, hopefully the personal relationships you've built through building tangible value with them can... Um, can allow you to speak more prophetically from the groundedness you have in marginalized communities to um, ask for a much more audacious change uh, that might be much more impactful. And I guess that's when I think you mobilize the community power to be able to kind of maybe take the other side of that line, like Jessica was saying, to be more adversarial mm -hmm. and say, look, we partnered in this positive ways, but let's also take it the step that really can tackle this challenge at a much more um, rigorous level. Great. Um, Melvin, did you want to jump in on this at all? Sure, we have one of the issues uh, in our community is the lack of uh, involvement on the part of community residents uh, in a variety of areas um, on some of the security issues and on some of the um, you know challenges and the lack of services that they face. Um, so we've just been talking to residents. We have a community engagement person on staff who goes out. Um, talk to residents, knocks on doors, uh, get the sense of what their concerns are, and uh, and then begins to develop, and then we develop activities around that. Lately, that involved um, organizing folks around um, security issues, uh, doing major neighborhood cleanups, trying to figure out ways to make the neighborhood less attractive to crime. Uh, and also when there are big development issues in the community, we, for example, this community has been trying to develop a, a library uh, in our neighborhood uh, for over more than 20 years. That, that was one issue where um, neighborhood residents came together and talked to the city and talked to our various politicians and policymakers in the area and said, uh, I think we think that this community deserves a, a better a better library. The the library that we have now is uh, located in a little brown and a little in a little corner store, uh, corner um, corner corner uh, like a grocery store. And uh, so that's some that's that's one that we've won, and uh, we've been able to uh, get a commitment, and we're going to have a new library. So on those kinds of issues, yeah, we we really need to uh, come together as a community and and talk to the policymakers. Great, thanks. Um, Melvin, I'm going to follow up with the question. Just, you know, you're working um, in a, a Puerto Rican neighborhood, right, in, in, in Hartford. Um, and, uh, you know, how do you, do, do you address uh, issues of racism in, in Anchor work when that comes up? You know, sure. what are some. It's a, it's a mixed neighborhood. It's, it's a majority Puerto Rican neighborhood that's changing now with, uh, with other groups coming in. But, um, we, one of the things that we do is a uh, positive promotion uh, through our own uh, media outlets, through our newsletters and, and presentations and so forth. We promote all of the assets and strengths of the neighborhood, which are many, many. Um, we also, I also go into the institutions, the Trinity College. I go to Hartford Hospital uh, and I go to the Children's Medical Center and talk to staff there. And through our jobs program, we're building relationships with a lot of the hiring managers. So in that way, we're also um, addressing, uh, you know, try, addressing uh, folks, and uh, often we have uh, we we host tours of nurses and other hospital personnel through the neighborhood. Um, and then, you know, there, there there are some instances where we have to um, just really address the issues specifically. Often, we talk about um, we hear people talk about revitalization of the neighborhood. And 
um, if we're listening carefully, sometimes that, that's a code word for um, bringing in not only um, people with I mean, here's where the race and the class issue get, get uh, um, come together, I think. Um, when, when people talk about revitalization, often they mean also bringing in a higher income, uh, higher income uh, buyers. And so we have to make sure that when people use words like revitalization, they are talking about, uh, we, you know, we, we, we point out the racially coded content of, of some of the uses of the word revitalization and, and make sure that folks, when they're thinking about what this community is going to look like in the future, because we all want a better future. It's not, we don't really want the community to stay like it is. We want to make sure that they envision that future containing the people who live here, work here, and who've been here uh, for, for over, you know, for, for 30 or more, more years. Great, thanks. Um, so I wanted to ask one more question, and I think I'll, I'll go to the audience questions. Uh, and thank you for all your questions. Um, but you know, so you know, in in my introductory talk, I talked a little bit about the idea of an anchor mission, and and um, you know, what is the what do you, do you see there a potential for uh, anchor institutions to have an anchor mission and act like uh, community institutions? If they did, what would that look like? Um, and Maybe I'll throw this to uh, Jessica first and, you know, let the best of you to step in. I had a feeling it was coming my way. Um, I think that from my perspective and the perspective of a lot of the community groups that I've worked with, it's, it's some of the things that other speakers have highlighted. That not only would anchors be thinking, um, be look more like the communities that they're serving. Not only would we have workforces that are more representative, not only would there be pathways for more students from these neighborhoods to um, have good jobs that were either within the healthcare system or adjacent to it. Um, but I think it also is, would require a culture shift in how and in the types of considerations and questions that anchors are asking um, and, you know, to Melvin's last point, just to pick up that, that theme around racially coded language and, and what we mean by revitalization, this is very similar to what's coming up within healthcare systems that, you know, are still approaching these issues from their own self-interest by and large um, in holding down costs and to some extent maximizing profit um, or to a great extent maximizing profit. Not to say they make a lot of profit, many have lean margins, but it's still a consideration. And so some of what I think um, we would like to see is that when anchor institutions are undertaking a strategy, thinking about an investment, they're not just thinking about the investment, but they're also thinking about who benefits um, from that investment and who loses, and ensuring that the community residents who are there already are, part, are on the benefit side. Because um, I do think that often in the cost-benefit analysis, those voices get lost today. Great, thanks. Uh, Felipe, anything you want to add? Well, I think, you know, in some of your question about how an anchor institution could act more like a community institution, what benefits they might see um, from that, you know, my, my thinking went to um, kind of these cultural factors that I think more of the staff of the anchor institution would be more creative, more creative in actualizing some of the real values, I think, that come from diversity and come from true inclusion um, and a cult, creating a culture of trust. I think so much of our dominant management structures and cultures, especially in anchor institutions, tends to be so dominant power, fear-based, and so staff, especially, you know, entry-level employees or low-level employees don't have the creative capacity to actually actualize their ideas in the workplace. And I think so often that gender inequity, the racial inequity um, becomes very clear in those spaces. And I think the more that uh, an anchor institution could change culturally to be more inclusive uh, by fostering trust in their HR processes. And when, when you do hire somebody from a local community, you know, trusting that local indigenous knowledge and I think reconnecting with, I think the transformative potential that I think each person has, um, I think that would be very exciting to me if we saw that kind of shift happen. Great, thanks. Uh, Melvin, anything you want to throw in? Yeah, I don't, I don't really have much to add, um, but I do think uh, uh, that anchor institutions could do more to promote the positive aspects of the community in which they're located, um, in addition to everything uh, that, um, that we've heard. I think that 
they could do um, more to just be more positive about the places where they're located. Great, thanks. Um, so let me start with a question from, from the audience, and this is one that I think is gonna be uh, familiar to Jessica, but um, so it came from a listener in Asheville, um, and as you may know, there's a major health system there that's converting from nonprofit to for-profit status. This, of course, has happened in a number of communities. You know, uh, the positive, of course, is there'll be a health conversion foundation. The negative is that it's it's going to be privately owned, uh, and profits may go outside of the community. You know, how does that affect? Um, you know, is you know how does that affect your work? You know, is, when when it's a for-profit institution as opposed to a nonprofit. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and this goes back to why I think Community Catalyst has tried to keep an eye on the policy side of the house as well. The, what, one of the things that we've observed is that, and, and I think it, you know, Melvin's points about leadership changes in all the institutions um, that he's been working with over the years really bear this out, is that it is possible to have anchor institutions adopt these approaches, and, and including for-profit institutions to adopt community-friendly approaches, but those are so frequently driven by leadership that when leadership changes for community organizations, you really could be worse off than you were before. You could be better off, but for some reason, better off doesn't seem to happen as frequently. Um, so we are in a place where the community benefit requirements for nonprofit hospitals are the law of the land, um, and they are regulated differently. I think for most communities, it's very um, abstract what it means to have a for-profit versus a non-profit institution. And so that by the time the community is really considering the implications, the deal is done. Um, I do think for our partners that have high for-profit infiltration into their healthcare market, we have encouraged them to start from the same place, start from the assumption that there may be other arguments, place-based arguments, economic arguments, that you can make to leadership and staff within those institutions. Don't just throw in the towel and assume things are not occurring um, or that there aren't opportunities to partner. But the reality is there are, there's one less lever to pull and that is the community benefit lever. So um, when that occurs, you know, usually communities have one of two options. If the for-profit partner is not interested, they can either make a shift and advocate for some type of policy change that will wrap in for profits in a different way. We've seen a little bit of that, but not too much. Um, or, you know, they can argue their case in the court of public opinion, um, which can be an effective strategy. It's harder to build long-term relationships in that way, but usually that is the, that's the last, last, um, last avenue that people can take. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a couple of questions about um, the Community Purchasing Alliance and so, and really sort of what is the scale that you need in order to be able to do this in your own community? Yeah, great question. It started very small for us with just 12 churches, synagogues working together on um, utility bills. Um, and then it went to trash hauling, realized many of them were paying um, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars a month for trash hauling, which should have cost only two or three hundred dollars a month. So it was initially came from seeing where many of smaller churches and schools are taken advantage of um, in, in certain contracting areas. And then by working together, we were able to see the data that some people are paying this amount, so they're paying this amount up here. And so it just kind of very practically grew out of that uh, place. And then a purchasing co-op, you know, funds itself through um, a rebate on the transaction. So when we help facilitate a new trash hauling contract with a uh, for example, Tenley Town Trash is our local trash hauling company in DC um, that you know is, does a very conscious effort to hire um, folks um, that may have been justice involved in their past. And so I think it's it's been interesting to see that we get 5% um, or, or a little more sometimes, a little less in other cases, but that creates a sustainable revenue stream now that you know has hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for us in, in reoccurring rebates. Um, and that becomes a very powerful engine to keep doing our work. And I think, um, 
it starts small, but it starts with an ambitious goal of how you grow that. And so our initial goal was 300 churches, uh, but we realized very quickly that that was going to be too much. And so we needed to kind of work with larger organizations. And so we started with charter schools. And then the evolution from charter schools now is into, you know, federally qualified health clinics and other larger nonprofits with property and social service agencies. And there's different um, segments of community institutions that I think uh, retirement communities and other area. We've had um, a couple member owners join us recently, union halls. Um, so I think it begins with any number of um, community institutions where you can build relationships with the really the economic or financial decision makers that do the property and facility management. And then just finding those categories, whether it's janitorial or um, copiers that you can kind of bring people together, help them make smarter decisions individually and then put in front of them options that are kind of enhance the values they share and you have and the community has, and I think can build an opportunity for them to make a pretty aggressive shift. We actually didn't start with an equity lens at our at the beginning five years ago. We start with just with, can we help them make smarter decision, a uh, better decision for their individual institution, but very quickly in our group conference calls, the participation, you know, 30 people talking together, they want to do good for the common good. And I think they naturally are, we all inclined towards that, but you have to facilitate a process that makes it really easy to make that transition. Um, so I think it's, it's gradual, but it's possible. Yeah, it's, it's hard to have that conversation if you don't know each other, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Melvin, uh, there's a, a question about, I think this goes for you, uh, it, it's sort of best practices in university engagement. I mean, you talked about the, the learning corridor as one example of that, but, you know, if folks are thinking in their communities and they're working with universities like you're working with Trinity, um, you know, what are what are some uh, best practices? And maybe think of it on both sides a little bit. Like, what are best practices from the place-based institution, you know, the anchor side, if you will, and from the from the community side? I think um, tackling each of these um, initiatives, the 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 living local, getting uh, the institutions from from the community side. I think tackling um, the maybe one initiative at a time, the living local, the hiring local, and the purchasing local. Um, maybe maybe uh, having a community campaign for one of those things, um, and then finding the representatives in the institutions um, that would have the most uh, clout and the most effect. Uh, I think that, that I think that that might be an effective strategy. Um, I think that these anchor institutions want want to consider themselves uh, a, a good member of their community. And then on the other side, let's face it, they're getting pressure. They're get, they're hearing from their mayors that they're receiving tax breaks. And increasingly in cities around the country. We see uh, the, the, the cities, the city administrations, the mayors um, trying to hold anchor institutions accountable to the services they receive by and the land that they occupy by asking for, for more contributions in the forms of uh, payments in lieu of taxes. And there's even a danger that the whole idea of a nonprofit status uh, could be in danger. If you hear in Connecticut, uh, there have been conversations on and off over the years of of, um, may, of uh, having institutions, large nonprofit institutions, pay contributions to the budget in the form of taxes. That's a kind of leverage. So, so on the one hand, I think so. Not only do institutions want to be good neighbors in within their community, they're also hearing it from from other sources that it's a really good idea to be a good neighbor. And I think from a community point of view, if you take the, 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 you know, each of these areas and work on it, if it's a hiring initiative that's important to the community, or the community wants to see more community people hired, then get together with all of your training partners the way that we've done here in Hartford, bring them together, show that there are trained folks who can take on entry-level jobs in, in, in the institution. If it's a purchasing initiative, then you would do a lot of what Felipe has been doing and other folks have been doing throughout the country and showing the value of investing in community-based uh, businesses. And if it's uh, you know, a live local initiative, then you know, you can certainly um, uh, get the institutions to provide incentives to their, to their, um, to their uh, uh, employees to live in the uh, institution. And I think that uh, from the institutional, in terms of institutional best practices, um, it's always useful to listen and to hear what community members 
at our community, for example, has a, a community advisory group, and uh, the hospital and the and the college send representatives to that. So it really begins by listening, sending folks to those meetings, listening to what their concerns and what they have to say, uh, and being responsive. I get a phone call uh, once every month, and sorry if I'm going on too long, from one of the major community uh, leaders in the community says, hey, the you know, the area around this particular institution is dirty. Um, you, why don't you do something to get that clean? <laughs> so anyway, it, it, yeah, the institutions are responsive. There are a few levers to, um, and a few a few ways to be good neighbors and a few levers to use. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Alvin. Um, so I wanted to ask a, a basic question. This came from the audience. So, um, you know, and I have um, my definition of an anchor institution, you know, Public or, or nonprofit owned, can't move large institution that you know. Uh, but but you guys might have some of your own uh, uh, definitions, you know. So you know, we I, I, I recall that you know uh, the forward of that book, you know, uh, there's a, a comment, you know, there's this uh, guy who used to be a university professor now at uh, Charles Luthizer, he's now at uh, Casey, but he's you know he was doing ethnography and, and he asked the resident, you know. Uh, he explained that Hopkins was an anchor institution, and 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 uh, the resident said, "Yeah, an anchor is something that drops on on your head. That sounds about right." Um, <laughs> so these, you know, so I want to take a step back from the terminology, and you know, just any thoughts on on what what makes, you know, what makes an anchor an anchor? Why is that important uh, for nonprofits in general? You know, beyond the fact that half of nonprofits are anchors, but it's well, I can add to that analogy really quickly and just say, I think from our community partners um, in the Bronx and in Portland and Minneapolis, one of the things that they would say that they would might consider adding is that an anchor institution is also one that sees its own fate tied up with the fate of the people. Um, so it's place-based, but it's also people-based. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's still very aspirational um, but it does, I think it's a part that we don't often talk about. Um, in our work, we have many examples of where we go into a community and we talk about hospital community benefit. We talk about and share examples of the work that hospitals are doing. And what we hear are stories from 30 and 40 years ago that where people say, um, you know, this hospital came in and my family was living in this middle-class African-American neighborhood and the hospital decided it wanted to expand and it did and the neighborhood scattered and you know here are the consequences for my family directly that pain is so close to the surface um, and the implications of that economically are really close to the surface so I think that's that's a key part is our, our faith bound together in the same way um, and the other thing it reminds me of very briefly is um, a great story from Alina Health in Minneapolis and their backyard initiative. They came up with this initiative around community health and took it out to the community and said, well, we wanna be partners with the communities that are in our backyard. And what they heard um, was actually, you're in our backyard. Um, so they kept the name of the backyard initiative but they talk about that story of really how the system came to realize um, all this work is so position positional and your viewpoint really changes based on whether you're in or out. Um, so. Great, thanks. Um, good story. I'll, I'll yeah. add from my perspective, I kind of define anchors in um, perhaps as opposed to the private sector that I think can leave communities more readily. Um, I think Bill said in his talk, you know, Pittsburgh from 600,000 to 300,000, largely due to manufacturing and, and, and private sector uh, employers that could go abroad. Um, and I think for me, I think of economic development and I think of all the incentives that states and regions and cities try to give to companies like Amazon. I think the Amazon HQ2 is a you know fascinating case study in how all the cities were pit against each other, right? And I think everyone was the bidding war. And the more we bid, the more we like gave away everything. Um, and I think if we had only collaborated cities and said, look, here's the floor, here's the, here's the max we're gonna be able to give, then I think it would have been such a much better outcome for communities. And so I think anchors are the institutions that are rooted and not moving. 
um, in a place and the, the institutions that are made up of the community in a different way and um, aren't going to pick up and leave five years or 10 or 20 or 50 years from now and I think can provide some some deep groundedness in a longer tradition and that's why I chose to work with the religious community primarily because I think they're grounded in generational traditions and I think um, can speak um, to the long-term uh, changes I think we need um, so that's kind of how I think about anchors Great, thanks. Um, oh, there's an anchor institution task force that meets uh, every year, and it basically is, ex is expanding the idea of um, anchor institutions whenever there's an interesting initiative that comes along. And so we've had art museums, of course, and libraries as anchor institutions. Mm -hmm. um, we've also had a, a labor union, which was very surprising, a very progressive labor union. And uh, here in Hartford, we've also had an insurance company that is contributing to an organization very much like Spina. So I think that the definition is fluid. Not everybody agrees that it's a nonprofit, although that seems to be a good uh, line. Um, and not all of the organizations are rooted in place, although that seems to be a pretty good line, too. All right. Um, thanks. Um, so I'm going to ask a question to, to Jessica, and this came from, there were a couple questions actually from the audience about um, uh, structural racism, and there was a particular question about the community engagement process that you were talking about, you know, for the community health needs assessment in Minnesota, and, you know, obviously they covered uh, ground that often isn't covered in a community health needs assessment, so how was that done? How? Just a clarification, how, yeah, well, how did they get involved well, well, in the process? Well, how, how was the engagement process structured to allow for that to occur? I see. Okay. Um, yes, I can describe that briefly. And then I'll also say that uh, the engagement process has to be described in a public report for any hospital's community health needs assessment. So we can also follow up with the link so you can see that. Um, I think in this instance, they used a process that's not totally um, different from what many hospitals do. They looked at what the hospital had done before and what's pretty standard in these, and you may have all participated in these, is a survey of questions, um, usually about 20 or 30 questions too long to community residents, um, always in English, sometimes if you're lucky in Spanish, um, more infrequently in other languages. And they looked at that and said, well, we this is, useful but it's not going to get the full picture and one of the strategies that they used in particular was to develop a list of key informants which is yet again is not an atypical strategy what was i think atypical was that they were very intentional about who they recruited for that and thought about the community organizations and leaders who were working within the different racial and ethnic um, groups that populated their core neighborhoods and they also, to my understanding, had a conversation internally as a hospital staff and agreed that they were going to use this process and really let the, what they heard drive what landed in the report. And I think that is so key because I think one of the critiques that does come up even in this instance is if the community shares that its priority is um, structural racism, we'll just use their example, there's, you know, I think a real managerial decision for hospitals who can look at that and say, well, what do we do with that? Um, we are a hospital. We're providing medical care. What, what, can, what and how can we address that? I think what was really novel here was that they were willing to say, that's what the community has said, and we're going to document it, um, and we are going to figure out together ways to address that. They may be small ways, but we're going to still, we're not going to be shy away from that big topic. Um, and so that is publicly available information. I think, um, broadly speaking, what I know from where hospitals are right now, most are in this cycle at the moment. They're doing their assessments. And so um, surveys, key informant interviews are critical strategies that often get used. But they also have to take community input whenever it comes. So you can reach out to a hospital community benefit person, ask for a meeting, share your idea, and in an ideal world, they will also record that in their their next go round of community comments. Yeah, and well, and it doesn't surprise me. I mean, you know, you look at, I mean, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has done a number of these maps, right, city by city, and you know, there can be 
you know, from one side of the DC Metro line to the other, or one part of Cleveland to the suburbs, you mm -hmm. know, 10, 20 years differences in, in, in life expectancy, right? Um, right. You know, so, I mean, I don't know, are, are you seeing that come up in other in other cities, you know, where, where structural racism is being identified? Oh, for sure. So I think, you know, this was this was unique because this was a hospital system taking this on. But there are a number of public health departments and state regulators who have actually said, we want to get past. We know that issues like tobacco use, if you talk to hospitals, they'll say the number one things we could do to, pro to promote length of life are probably addressing obesity and tobacco use. Um, and that's not wrong, but um, that's not usually what the person on the street will say their number one health challenges or their number one life challenge is. Um, and so there are a number of public health departments and others who've said, let's use these assessments to dig a little deeper and let's use what comes up from the community and these community benefit resources to tackle some of those deeper rooted issues. Maybe I think in most cases, structural racism is usually referenced in the rationale, um, but uh, Massachusetts just revised to align and ask hospitals to invest in things like affordable housing, um, the opioid crisis, but also um, I've seen ones around transportation, I've seen things around um, employment. So there's, an, there's a real effort, I think, in some parts of the country to go deeper and use these resources to ask those harder questions. What is driving obesity? Is it because people are eating the wrong food or is it because actually they can't get food or they can't get healthy food where they are? which is a much deeper question. Thanks. Um, I think I'll ask this next question to Melvin, but uh, so this came, you know, so there's a number of people on this call who are uh, board members of organizations. So say I was, so the question is sort of, you know, say I, I'm turned on by this anchor concept, I want to introduce it to my board. You know, how, how does one go about doing that? I they're board members of a community development organizations or of anchor institutions do you think? Um, um, well, the person didn't specify in their question, so I guess you could take it either or both ways. So let's say, say you're on the board of a, of a, of a hospital or, um, or of a, a, a university or another kind of anchor institution, then um, there are this is an there's an anchor institution movement. There are lots of folks like Steve Dub, for example, uh, and other folks around the country who talk about who studied anchor institutions extensively and who talk very persuasively and eloquently about the social obligations and and the the work, the positive work that anchor institutions can do. So you really uh, have a lot of resources to bring these folks. And that's, that's the very first thing I did when I uh, came to Sina six years ago. I brought um, Ted Carroll, uh, who is a well-known uh, national spokesman for uh, anchor institutions, to talk to the chief executives of our, of our institutions because I think you know, we need to hear that message. We need to evangelize, even within this very favorable structure that I'm in, we need to evangelize every so often. We've had 18 or 19 uh, changes in, in chief executives. If you're sitting in the uh, in, on the board of a nonprofit organization that wants to link itself to an anchor institution, then I, I'm just going to have to go back and and first, you know, get to know the, who the key leaders are, who the community, who the folks are on the committee panel. Do address the issue when you meet somebody. Do address the issue of the community needs assessment. That's a very neat, that's a new tool. As Jessica has said, it's something that's an important leverage that we have. It's a way of getting a meeting with a chief executive and then talking about, you know, one of the things that, that the anchor institution can do uh, in terms of hiring, per, uh, purchasing, or or, uh, or incentivizing, uh, um, you know, people to live in the city, but also help the school systems. That's another way that anchor institutions can be very useful. They can be a real active presence in the school system, mentoring programs, uh, lots of different ways um, that, that you can do that. Great, thanks. A uh, question I'm gonna ask for Felipe, um, but this came out, you know, basically a question around how do you develop supply chains with anchors? And, you know, that seems like a lot of what you guys do. So uh, take it away. Yeah, I think, 
it begins getting to know the small businesses themselves and getting to know their needs and challenges. And I think when you talk about structural racism and the wealth gap, I see business ownership as one of the best ways to, to build wealth in communities of color and in local communities. And so, um, you know, for us, it's, it's getting to know those business owners right now and mapping them and working with um, um, these small owner operated companies um, in our, in our, case we're focused most on service and facility and property management categories. Um, but for example, um, a janitorial company, most often owned by an immigrant owned um, uh, service industry is one we work with in DC. Her name is Gladys Martinez. Um, we have a, um, a great relationship. She had four or five clients when we met her and she had 10 or 20 staff and the, the union SEIU 32BJ said very positive things about her. And so part of our mission was to kind of work with her and help expand to more churches. And of course, uh, she was very flexible in working with us. And I think um, now she's at a place with, you know, more than a couple hundred staff that I think she can be part of that supply chain for Anchor. So I think from the Anchor perspective, it's it's reaching down into segmenting the contract so it's small enough for a small business. Um, and I think it's beginning to think about what are specific scopes we can delegate out and um, take a more relational approach to the business owner. I think when you're working with owner operated companies, you're the, all the professionalism of, of normal transactions, I think it needs to be much more um, catered to the individual relationship with that person and the individual particularities. And I think we find our owner operated small firms tend to be really hungry and really driven. You know, their own personal experience equips them with a motivation that kind of transcends what I think most professional people think of. And so I think that allows them to work much more effectively and deliver at a much higher level than your, than your you know, standard large national company that the university might be working with. So from my perspective, it, it takes uh, reaching down uh, to be patient, uh, it takes breaking up scopes to be very specific. And then, you know, working with community partners, we see ourselves as a really key third party intermediary, right? We're not, we, we help facilitate the buyer and the, the vendor. Um, and I think by being a part of it, we can be there for ongoing mediation when things come up. So inevitably there's some tension that arises. Um, uh, expectations weren't met by a certain provider. Um, it seems like what one of the big things we can do is really um, be there to help understand both sides and come to a, a great resolution. So I think anchors need to do more to think about small scopes of work that can then build kind of a pipeline. And I think thinking of small community institutions like churches and schools can be a key great way. Ask them, who are they? Using. More often than not, they're using and anchoring real contracts already and just kind of bridging that into the bigger supply chain. Great. And uh, so there's one more question I wanted to get to, but I don't know if I have time, so I'm going to just answer it for the person. But, you know, sort of how do you work in small communities? And I think what you're talking about is a way you can work in small communities. Most small communities still have churches and, you know, other organizations. And so, you know, the the, the the application will be different, but but the principles I think are still still hold. Um, so um, I don't know if there's any quick comments. I have like 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. One piece is just don't think of any property owner. I think can be an anchor institution in a certain way, right? From the small smallest in a small community. And so thinking about engaging the person that makes those business decisions, I think they're often not engaged in these more missional questions. And if you give them the opportunity to make their everyday economic decision in a more mission aligned way, whether it's investing or purchasing or hiring, all those things, I think any small institution can, can be that. All right, well, um, I, we do need to wrap up. We wanna finish on time and respect people's time. Uh, thanks for everyone uh, for participating in this webinar uh, and for all your great questions. And thanks especially to uh, our uh, panelists, Melvin Cologne from Asina, Felipe Wichker from a community purchase uh, purchasing alliance and Jessica Curtis from CUNY Catalyst and of course uh, Bill Jenneret from uh, Duquesne University uh, so thanks so much and uh, look forward to joining you um, in another month on looking at policies that can actually promote uh, more democratic economic economy work thanks so much thank you thank you